Mary and George Villiers, the most fascinating mother and son duo in British history that you've probably never heard of. Mary, a down and out aristocrat with a cunning wit and insatiable desire for power. And George, her impossibly beautiful son who proved the ultimate weapon for penetrating and then dominating King James's court. The two rock the foundations of 17th century England, performing an astonishing display of social climbing to wreak political havoc and seize a terrifying volume of power. As someone with a lifelong obsession with iconic women and something of a penchant for niche trivia, I want to know more about this tumultuous period of Jacobean history. And about the lives of the courtiers and royals as they romped their way, on horseback obviously, through the early 1600s. So I'm here to meet the new wave of historians unravelling these complex, messy, emotional versions of our past. And the creative forces responsible for bringing it all back to life. This is Jacobean history, but not as you know it. This is Mary and George, and me. The audacious historical psychodrama Mary and George has resurrected these formidable characters to portray a twisted battle of sex, love, and power. But in order to fully grasp the societal structures that Mary so elegantly dismantled, I wanted to know a little bit more about Jacobean times and King James I's English reign, which is where my new best friend, author, scholar, and low-key genius, Catherine Rundell, comes into play. So to begin with, do you mind giving us just a kind of broad overview to what's so fascinating about this section of British history? If you picked up the Jacobean court and turned it upside down and shook it, <laughs> out of it would fall so many schemes and love affairs and a thousand machinating souls. It was a time where if you could not strategize, you fell by the wayside. And it was also incredibly glamorous. It was a moment where people were moving away from the more strict chivalric code of Elizabeth and towards something a little bit looser and a little bit wilder. Cut! Hold it there. Okay, so short intermission for those who slept through history class. The Jacobean era, Jacobus being Latin for James, spans from 1603 to 1625 and is best known for its cultural bangers, namely Shakespeare, Guy Fawkes' gunpowder plot, and King James's V popular translation of the Bible, which remains one of the most widely read texts in the world. Starting life with a bang, no pun intended, in 1567, barely out of nappies, James, aged one, becomes King of Scotland after his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, was forced off the throne and imprisoned. In 1603, when Queen Elizabeth I died without an heir, James inherited the English crown to become King James I of England and VI of Scotland, a step towards unifying the two nations. And now, back to the main event. What can you tell us about James I and how he rose to power? Shortly after he became king, a secretary wrote to the Doge of Venice that he seems to have forgotten that he is king, except in his kingly pursuit of stags, to which he is much dedicated. Wow. He also had terrible table manners. His tongue was slightly too big for his mouth, so when he drank, he used to dribble. So there's this version of the king, a literal dribbling idiot. <laughs> but then there's a reimagining of the king, the scholar king. And is there a particular way that James I ruled that we can see now? Was he any different to other monarchs? James's court was more fluid, a little bit more open. Everything was a little bit looser and newer. And we have these fascinating letters written by people who had been prominent in Elizabeth's court, panicking that they no longer understood the rules and are utterly dismayed at what they're experiencing as a kind of sneak pit. So it was clear from the beginning of James's reign that he was going to rewrite the rule book of British aristocracy. Fast forward 20 years and you find Mary ready to take advantage of this new, loose society for her own gains. I'm here at the National Portrait Gallery, which is my favorite place in London. It's very exciting today because apparently there's a portrait of Mary Villiers here in the archive that they've agreed to, uh, you know, get out and dust off for us. Follow moi. Obviously she's absolutely stunning. Where does she normally live? She's part of our reference collection, so she's normally kept in the archive basement. How many other images have you ever seen of Mary Villiers? Well, I guess the most beautiful one is a full-length uh, painted portrait 
but we haven't seen that since it was sold at Christie's in 1938. No one knows where it is now. So someone's just got that hanging in their house, potentially? I hope so, yes. Do many people come asking to see images of Mary Villiers? No. That's really sad. It, it is, given the significance of her life and her achievements. Eyes fresh from the real deal, Mary, it was time for a coffee with Julianne Moore to find out how she brought her version of this devious woman to life on screen. Mary's character was outrageous, in a sense. Here was this person who had absolutely no agency of her own, no autonomy, didn't own any property, had such a strong sense of self and a, and a directness and a kind of an ambition for herself and particularly for her children. And when you think about what she managed to achieve, she really left everyone set up very, very well. And can you describe this relationship she has with her children, in particular, of course, there's George. Right. What was it about him that she saw that she felt she could sort of manipulate more than her other children? In her educating them, she learned that George was like utterly charming and a great dancer. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't great at academics, but he was great at entertaining people. She sees his charm and his beauty and how attractive he is to other people especially to someone like King James I, yeah. who is kind of her like main prize. Her idea is to find a way to, you know, after the death of her first husband, who we portray as a brutal and difficult man, she's looking for a way to educate her children and keep herself alive. Mm -hmm. And the only way she's able to do that is through her relationships with powerful men. And she herself, therefore, becomes powerful, but mm -hmm. she's quite a complex character. Right. How did you go about playing someone like Mary Villiers? There was something so outrageous about her, something so direct. She seemed to have her own desire for power in a situation where she might possibly have none. Mm -hmm. It felt really unusual and clever. I think she's written brilliantly. D.C. Moore, Dave, our writer, I think wrote a really interesting, compelling, very funny, ambitious woman. What if I go later? And I'm older. You could. But if you miss this chance, you'll fail us all. And live like your father, smeared the unwashable excrement of eternal shame. Bon voyage. Do you have an opinion about what was motivating Mary Villiers? I think ambition. Right, <laughs> just raw, you know? kind of like first. Well, then. I think, yeah, yeah, but also um, survival. Yeah. You know, when you have no autonomy, you have no agency, all you have is really, you know, through who you're married to and, and realizing that she has to wield her own charm or sexuality to gain that agency. So it's either going to be through someone that she marries or someone that her sons are aligned with. And so she did manage to do that really pretty well. No, it's so impressive. Yeah. As you say, like women obviously were completely disenfranchised at that time. Mm -hmm. There were very few options. It's pretty impressive stuff. She's like a chess master maneuvering her men around like pawns. I'm personally intrigued to find out what it's like to be on the receiving end of her powers. What is George's relationship with Mary like and how does that kind of evolve? It's a very complex relationship, but he's the second son. Mary sees the potential in him, chooses him out of all her children to really put her faith in and, and, and back. He's just desperate for her validation and her love, and he'll do anything to achieve that. She really manipulates him. And there's obvious genuine love there, but it, it's, it never really comes unconditionally, which is a very difficult thing for a, a child to have. It's interesting as well that your character is kind of raised like a girl. It's things we've seen in other series where they're playing the piano or whatever, or it's kind of... Yeah using their wiles. It's very interesting. I, I think it, it lends some level of femininity to this this masculine character. And I mm. think, you know, we're, we're obviously in this this really interesting time nowadays where, where the sort of borders between masculinity and femininity are kind of blending a little yeah. bit. There is something within that that modern audiences, I think, will really appreciate and be able to connect with. This is a woman operating in a male-dominated world. And no family rose this quickly in, in, in such a high trajectory during this period of time. And her power and, and you know, Julianne's performance in portraying Mary, it's hard not to admire. It took a team of creatives to excavate this dark and twisted history, where it seems to have lain hidden for the past few hundred years. That's until exec producer Liza Marshall got involved. It's kind of your fault, all of this. 
I suppose so, yes. I was reading an article about five years ago and I saw a little piece about James I being gay. I started doing loads of research and tried to find a really interesting way into his story. And then I came across Ben Woolley's book, The King's Assassin, then took it to Dave, who then wrote the brilliant scripts. Obviously, you read Ben's book. What happens next? How do you approach fictionalizing this text? The amount of information there is about Mary, for me, is perfect. There are glimmers of this astonishingly powerful and influential person working behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, that really appeals to me because it means I get to make a lot up, but I also can sort of return to the well of truth every now and then for the general curve of it. Yeah. When you're writing the scripts, you're like, how do I give this person an agency and intelligence and a wit that she must have had? So Thomas Compton. Afraid so. You? Your next wife. Sorry, love. Don't be. She clearly had enormous ambition, but that doesn't show up in the historical record, basically until later in her life when people start to get annoyed with her. They're very puzzled how this woman from a relatively lowly, lowly gentry background managed to achieve this enormous influence in James's court. There was a kind of scrabble to understand who she was and where she came from. I do not own my home or any asset. My children are unwed. If the king's affection for you curdles, we have nothing. What was it about Mary Villiers in particular that you found so compelling? What I always want to do is try and put women at the centre of history, because too often history's been written by the men. In fact, entirely history's been written by men. She's a minor character in the book, but I just think the idea that she essentially pimped out her very hot second son to seduce James I was a brilliant jumping off point for a story. Her behaviour is complicated in the sense that it's hard to know whether she's this iconic woman managing to find her way to power or whether she was just using someone and is kind of a bit of a dark lord. <laughs> How do you view her? Um, I think without doubt she was the smartest person in the room. So I think to go from the outer reaches of the gentry, she was essentially a serving woman. So not quite a servant, but was working in service, you know, as a sort of gentlewoman to a, a lady. And to go from there to become the closest woman to James I is such an extraordinary rise at a time when women had virtually no power. Do you see Mary as a feminist? It depends what the definition of feminism is. I mean, if it means supporting other women, I think probably the answer is no, because she's definitely prepared to throw other women under the bus if, she, you know, if it helps her rise to power. She's not a sympathetic woman, but she's doing whatever she can at that time to survive. Mm -hmm. So I think you like her, despite the fact that maybe sometimes she does some dark things. Yeah. She doesn't have to be a nice person for us to be compelled by her journey. What do you think the value is of portraying these amazingly kind of complex female characters? Because that's how women are in real life. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I think these stories are really important. Yeah. I think you need to refocus history and remember all the powerful women that were there. And even though it's a slightly heightened world mm. that we're in and that Dave has created with his scripts, pretty much everything you see in their drama is true. Yeah. So she really did do all of these crazy things. I think it's pretty astonishing that Mary Villiers is someone that's kind of ostensibly been written out of history, but actually her actions and her gumption and this kind of propulsion she had to like better her life and that of her families has led to very meaningful historical events, and yet it's someone that we've overlooked. Think of how many more women there are in history to explore that have had this butterfly effect on the way we are.